So please uh, enjoy the dessert while I'm talking. I, I, uh, I should begin by saying I'm a, a glass half full sort of guy, as my wife Mona knows. I, I feel usually lucky, uh, fortunate, indeed blessed. Uh, that said, uh, I am mindful as I begin that uh, some of us are still jet lagged. I'm uh, already not. It's mindful. Already daytime. It's already. It's already. Yeah. I'm my, it's already daytime for us. Yeah. I'm mindful that uh, this has been a long, wonderful day, and that I am following uh, <coughs> Professor Jacobson, who uh, spoke brilliantly about a very deeply theoretical topic. And I am um, mindful also that you've all just had dinner and uh, probably a little bit of dessert. So. Uh, under these circumstances, I, uh, I'm knowing I was the fifth of five, te of five speakers, I have decided to be light, if possible, and certainly to be brief. What I, what I thought I would do is tell uh, just two stories, very, two very short stories, and pose a few questions. And we can, uh, I'll literally ask you to think about the two or two questions in each story and talk for however long we want to talk about it and then I'll move on to the second story and we'll talk about uh, the questions that I pose there or any others that you want to ask or comment on and then we will, uh, I will call it an evening and turn it over to Rob Ty and I know he has some closing remarks. I, uh, as I was thinking about my remarks, I thought about the theme, uh, both the theme of uh, current challenges of universities of faith in a secular world, but, but, uh, but repairing or constructing a world. So my stories, I hope, are in line with that. The first story is really, as you will see, explains why uh, Rabbi uh, Shabtai invited me. Uh, he watched a video that uh, was uh, uh, part of what, uh, uh, a full lecture on, I'm going to only talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the lecture. And then the second story relates to a symposium that uh, took place at St. Mary's University in late September. So let me begin uh, by uh, when I received uh, the invite and then, uh, and then uh, had a Zoom moment with Shabtai, I realized that he, uh, he had invited me because I had uh, given a lecture that is part of our Catholic intellectual tradition series. We offer uh, three or four uh, lectures a year. They're usually distinguished uh, scholars from outside St. Mary's like yourselves. There's usually a theme. And the theme, this was in 2013, 2014, so about five years ago. The theme of the four lectures that year was the enterprise of faith. And uh, my talk, it's not uh, my talk, my lecture, uh, the third of those four was the Catholic University as a faithful enterprise. And so as I tried to think about, you know, the term enterprise, that seemed like an odd, to me, an odd term to use in connection with faith. Uh, I began to think about a term, I think you know my background is law, and I did some research on it, and I... Uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of an odd term in, in part because enterprise tends to have this, we were early hearing about Google, this multinational, big corporate uh, feel about it, Google or Microsoft or Amazon. So peculiar in that respect. Uh, enterprise also has a more sinister meaning. Uh, at least in the United States, a, a, a gangster-like, mobster-like feeling. And I talked in my lecture a little bit about my uh, shady background to give this meaning some flavor. So here's, it begins uh, with uh, Angelo Inciso. We, I grew up in an area of Chicago that was uh, filled with uh, members of the Chicago Mafia. I won't go into the details of all that I knew about that. I went to school with the sons and daughters of members of the mafia. Uh, and as a young boy, I'd say nine, nine or ten, ten years old, we, uh, the house we lived in was just two doors down from 
uh, Mr. and Mrs. Incizo, and there's Mr. Incizo. I, I really have to correct myself. I actually didn't live two doors down from Mr. Incizo. We lived two doors down from Mrs. Incizo. Mr. Incizo was never around, and as a nine or 10 year old, I heard my parents whispering one day, and you know, I, I'm imagining looking back in the kitchen that Angelo Incizo, Mr. Incizo, was in jail. Uh, and, and my recollection, my, you know, I grew up thinking Mr. Incisor, who I never saw, by the way, in the house that my parents owned for 33 years, that he was in the, in the federal penitentiary for income tax evasion. Well, I, you know, I've always looked back and wondered why my parents were whispering. I guess they were afraid, perhaps, that I would, uh, you know, have nightmares about Mr. Incisor. Of course, he was locked in jail, so that was an odd thing. But later, as a lawyer in Washington, D.C., I discovered that Mr. Incizo had gone to prison not for income tax evasion, which is how Al, why Al Capone went to jail, but because he was a mobster and he was prosecuted. I, I was doing research on a statute called, John knows this statute, the RICO statute. Now, you know, RICO is, uh, in the, at least in the United States, is associated with, in almost every gangster movie, one of the gangsters' name, usually the guy that got killed, his name was Rico. Well, Rico is the appropriate statute, the Racketeering in Corrupt Organizations Act. And, and I, uh, I have never read a case with as much interest as U.S. versus Incizo, in which Mr. Incizo was convicted under the Rico statute. So that's not all. That was, that was my, uh, the guy who would have lived two doors down from me, uh, but he was in jail. Tony Big Tuna Cardo, in contrast, lived just down the block from me in a, you know, just an enormous mansion. Tony Accardo, for those of you who are from the United States may know, he was the head of the Chicago Mafia for, for many years. I don't remember why big, his nickname was Big Tuna. And as I look back on it, I should have been scared of Tony Accardo, right? Uh, not, not, not Mr. Incizo, because Tony just lived a block away. But uh, again, th those of us who grew up in the United States, there's a, there's a, feast, uh, there's a feast day that, be, that has become Halloween and in which you know, young children, sometimes through teenage years, uh, go trick-or-treating and get tons of candy. Uh, Mr. Mrs. Incizo gave, this is in the early 60s, a full box of Cracker Jack. That's wow. an, think about Ooh, that. I mean, those of us who have our gray or balding, we used to get little pieces of candy, but, but Mrs. Incizo was good for a, for a full box of Cracker Jack. So there were other mobsters. Uh, Paul the waiter Rika lived, uh, oh, probably uh, about a mile from my house. Sam, uh, Sam uh, Gincana, Sam the Cigar Gincana, was uh, gunned down in his basement. He lived in Oak Park, a little, probably a couple of miles from our house. And then Jackie the Lackey Cerrone, who later took over the Chicago Mafia. My sister Mary Ellen went to her eighth grade dance with his son Tom Cerrone. So that's my background. And you could, should be one, wondering, could be wondering and asking a few questions. One, why are three of these guys wearing sunglasses in, in, indoors. Uh, the other question is why, after Shabtai watched and listened to the YouTube video, did you invite <laughs> such a, a guy from such a sordid background? So you may have a because comment. Because of the enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. You have, you have the same barber as Jackie the <laughs> <laughs> And he's not wearing sunglasses yet. <laughs> <laughs> so the third meaning, you know, the third meaning of enterprise is as uh, a purposeful, systematic, I'll say pervasive activity. And that's the meaning that then I came to understand that resonated with me and I, it should resonate with all of us associated with in, uh, universities of faith. Uh, thinking in my case about a Catholic university and its commitment to promoting faith on campus and beyond uh, in the communities that we live and work in. Uh, I won't uh, read or summarize my lecture, f uh, or we would be here for longer than I would like, but, uh, but simply say that my, uh, my talk attempted to answer, you know, should a Catholic university 
be a faithful enterprise, be pervasive, and how, how does one do that? Um, how, uh, in order to be effective, do we help uh, our students on their journeys uh, to follow God's call, uh, as I said, in a systematic, organized, pervasive way, not siloed in uh, campus ministry or in the theology or philosophy department, but more broadly. Uh, there are obviously several dimensions to that question. Uh, curricular, uh, some of us have been chatting, uh, you know, sometimes on the rides here or, 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 uh, or in sidebars about the reforms that are going on, the modifications of curricula at, at Catholic liberal arts universities. We know, those of us in this room know, that the liberal arts themselves are grounded in a theology uh, that, uh, that uh, sees God as, uh, you mentioned, reference uh, Francis, uh, seeing God in all creation and all nature. And certainly that's, that's the grounding in which we uh, uh, endeavor uh, over the many decades to educate our students uh, more broadly than one might uh, receive in a more technical uh, single discipline uh, education. Uh, other, uh, we referenced earlier service learning and I think uh, Jim may be talking about that tomorrow. Uh, the, uh, I was struck, I hadn't really been focused on it before the tour this afternoon, but that religious symbolism uh, in, in, uh, in, spa in the sp spatial dimensions, in the aesthetic, in the, uh, in the sculpture, in the architecture, in the landscape of a university can have a powerful role in uh, communicating to students in unspoken ways, but important ways. And then uh, uh, our, the, the founder of the Mariness, uh, William Joseph Chaminade, uh, wrote, uh, as we know that faith, this is a quote, faith is instilled more deeply in the spirits and hearts of the students through the atmosphere that permeates the school rather than through teaching. Uh, faith working through love, we've talked about that. Shamanat spoke of the gesture, the helpful, kind action. Um, so let me uh, stop there uh, and uh, what I was going to say is this, you know, this story, uh, putting our mobsters to the side, this story is really about uh, how we repair or construct, help repair or construct the world on our campuses. I think the second story will be beyond that. I'm, oh, I'm not getting any movement here. Oh, oh here we go. <laughs> Yes. Yep, there we go. <clears throat> okay. So those are the questions that I'd like to pose for, you know, five or ten minutes and then we can go to the next second story. How do we promote this is a certainly a US United States question, a Catholic university question. How do we promote the enterprise of faith given the diminishing number of religious on campus and at many campuses inconsistent hiring if not today certainly historically inconsistent hiring for mission of lay faculty and staff the uh, you know the background for st. Mary's and I think we can all we can share that more broadly the background for st. Mary's is 50 years ago 70% uh, of the faculty and staff on campus and professional staff certainly were Marianist brothers Today, of the 200 faculty, we have maybe two or three Marianists teaching part-time. Was there bias against them? No, there's just 200. There are, uh, there are 270 Marianist brothers in the United States. There are three universities. There are 16 high schools and four retreat centers, and the average age of the Marianist is probably north of 75. Right. There may be fewer than, five years ago I knew there were fewer than uh, 30 Ma Marianist brothers under the age of 60. And I, that, that's not all of the orders, but many of the orders. Uh, I know Bob, uh, uh, Bob and I were talking about uh, the, the, brothers. the brothers in the LaSalle tradition. Yeah. So, so that's first question. And the second quest question, 
I think is uh, uh, Professor Jacobson made some references to, you know, elections recently met, had a sidebar about uh, Donald Trump without getting into politics. We know that we are facing globally, uh, I speak, uh, you know, for, we speak from the perspective of the United States that uh, there's increasing polarization of uh, uh, boorish behavior throughout our society. It's on the universities and off and, and, and certainly throughout society. How, as a, as a university of faith, how as a Catholic university, how as a Jew, Jewish university do we impart to our students uh, that the, the, the values that will lead to being able to work in the world to repair and to find common ground. What do we do, what do we need to do on campuses to promote that? Uh, and are we doing that? So those are the two questions I thought worth our consideration. And could we ask, how do we uh, bring in a religious community if we need one? Uh, and two, how do we have the more consistent hiring permission of lay faculty and staff. I mean, yeah. That, I mean. so the, your, your first about bringing in um, <coughs> religious, uh, I don't know about the other orders, but the Marianists are, are so humble that they are really terrible about marketing themselves and talking about all of the good things that they do. And yet, in the in the community among students, they you know, including our own children, at, at different times they talk about wanting to do something that matters and not wanting to be bogged down by material things and not <clears throat> looking for something that has purpose. And yet, there's no one asking them, "Have you ever thought about joining a religious order?" I mean, it does come with you restrictions. Think that's do I think it's in? It's important that you should join a religious order. Well, there are lots of ways that you can do it, but that's that's a question that never gets doesn't seem to ever get answered or asked of the students or the young people today. They're they're you know there's no one saying have you ever considered a vocation? Do you, you know maybe you have a vocation? Have you ever thought about it? Just to, just to, as an idea. So I I guess uh, I had in mind. Is it possible to invite other religious communities? Is that just ruled out to begin with? And I'm not just talking about your university, but other schools. Well, I think that's an interesting thought, and and uh, I, I I am uh, we have probably a dozen Marianists who are active on campus, and then there's another 40 who are retired, ranging from retired and able to uh, in hospice. I'm not going to be here when there's only a, a few. Right? I mean, I won't be president of St. Mary's, but I, as I look forward, I just made the comment the other day, the solution for St. Mary's is, is actually probably in part what you've suggested to recruit faculty or staff who are religious from other orders or diocesan. So, um, it, 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 you know, if, and I think, I. I by your question, I'm going to assume the answer is yes. If you um, believe that it is vital for a Catholic university to have a percentage of its members be religious. Religious here means you know, or, members of religious order congregation. Priests. Not, not just people that are devout. Brothers. So historically, or, yeah, right. and, um, or sisters. The founding, the founding people who take yeah, a vow of poverty don't, wouldn't have this, would have... Uh, yeah. A, a contribution of time and a lot of income, so that would really help the university to have a, a religious community uh, working there. Shanto? I think that David is 100% right. There is something that the numbers are the numbers diminishing. I think it signals that the time of older identity is towards its end, tapering off. Mm -hmm. And and uh, we have, you have to rethink the idea of order. Once, you know, like an elect unit in the elect unit in the army, the excellence of an order was something that was attractive. And you are this and not that. You are this unit, not that. You are this order, attractive people. But now it comes to end. 
<coughs> so probably what, what will appeal to people more is something on a much broader principle, that the, the, the identity comes from faith itself, and you're willing to dedicate yourself to faith, and not from the specific order, and maybe not even for, from a specific religion. And uh, this, of course, is a revolution, not easy to stomach, but it seems that it, that's what it's coming to. Yeah, to pull the yeah. resources together. Yeah. May I uh, uh, follow up on this and at the same time address question number two, also number number one, precisely because of its equal importance? <laughs> this, how how we are, uh, how uh, how do we impart to students the ethic of bridge building of seeking common ground? And I would suggest that there is much more common ground uh, than uh, we usually realize among uh, among our students. It is, uh, it is just uh, getting covered <coughs> up by the, uh, uh, the clamor of the activist loudmouths. But uh, most students are uh, really on common grounds. They are not racist. So they are not uh, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of things that um, uh, people uh, tend to uh, uh, get worked up about nowadays in politics. Then, um, most of these conflicts are uh, rather artificially inflated. Um, you and get, you see a very specific slice of population. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's not uh, racist. And it's, it's, uh, no, actually, uh, I, th uh, I think the majority is not racist. Mm -hmm. The majority is, uh, uh, th but that is the silent majority, as opposed to the thin, sl thin slice that is making all the clamor. And uh, I think we can just uh, reinforce the existence. That is what we should do. This is what, this is what I do in my classes. Um, I have no two students of the same shade or color. Um, I am, uh, and yet, um, they are uh, ab um, totally aware of um, what is common to all of them, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, common pursuit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and just reinforcing this sense of what is common already, yeah. as opposed to all these inflated and artificially blown up differences, the big differences in identity politics. Yeah. Does that? Yeah. I would just broaden. Yeah. I, I I I understand. I hear your point, mm -hmm. and I agree with that. Uh, I would just say though that it's a broader challenge in our society that, quite frankly, I think preceded the last couple or three years. If you look at how. Uh, educated commentators now <coughs> routinely interact with each other uh, both on regular news but in through social media the way you know the the soundbite and, mm -hmm. and anger and yes. demonization of both right. sides or it all the sides it attracts all attention it's it attracts attention and it attracts ratings but it but I my, you know, my concern is it models behavior that right. Uh, that all of us in this room know is not right, mm. is not the norm in which we have lived, but it's the norm of the 19-year-old. That's my, th mm. that question really, I, I say, I, I want to say it's beyond this, you know, this, however long we have this administration. But, but seriously, do they imitate those behaviors? I mean, I, 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 I almost I, wish they would. I think they're, very, they're, they're, they're quite passive in the classroom, if anything. New York, New York City may be different, Boston, but yeah. Um, in my experience, um, uh, uh, students, um, especially, so uh, there are, hmm, let's say, very intelligent discussions about issues about race, but um, it is not realized in any sort of enmity or hostility in their behavior. They are very intelligently discussing issues of race without being biased, race biased, in, well, even, uh, not to mention racist. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, um, I think, uh, uh, in this uh, generation, is actually becoming a non-issue. Because they have learned to live together, uh, and there are uh, interracial uh, uh, Friendships, uh, uh, dating, marriages, etc. At least, that is New York City. 
Well, uh, one of the, I, I, my yeah, yeah, sure. well, one of the studies, I think it's from the Pew, might be Pew, but one of the studies has been carried on in the United States over decades. So in the 1960s, uh, the, the survey asked three, three sets of questions, but one of them is, if your child uh, wanted to marry someone of a different race, how would you feel about that? And somewhere on the order of 75% of American parents would say that was unacceptable. Whereas today, when they're surveyed, 75% would say, it's fine. doesn't matter yes. if my child yeah. marries someone of a different race or not. However, right. in the same time frame in the 1960s, if they said, what percent, uh, how would you feel about your child marrying someone who's from a diff whose family affiliates with a different political party, uh, back in the 60s, 90% would have said, no problem. No. We're Republican, they marry a Democrat, no, no issue. Today, it's like 75% say, that's a real problem. <laughs> it's a huge percentage, yeah. three quarters would say, it's a problem that my child would marry someone. And, and, and that is because of this misguided uh, activism and, uh, right. and uh, all the um, so it has real influences. It's, so it's not just in the in the media. It has a real effect. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and, and, and political differences nowadays can actually tear families apart. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and it's just ridiculous, but it is happening. Yeah, yeah. That's really. Good. I mean, I, yeah. I I agree with you on the, uh, in terms of our of the yeah. of our students. Um, uh, views about inclusivity and discrimination, but the broader topic that Jim mm -hmm. addressed is, is real, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, I want to believe also that our students, in many ways, have transcended or moved beyond some of the issues that maybe we, we have thought of, kind of like what you're saying, when it comes yeah. to issues like race, sexuality, it's almost like they're past it, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and, and the faculty and staff are kind of running to play catch up almost. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but, but in, in that regard, too, um, I think both questions speak to how our institutions are supposed to be different um, from, say, a public institution or a non-faith-based. And, and I see one question enhancing the other, because on the one hand, with the top question, you want people of faith, a religious order, lay people who are Catholic or spiritual, because those are the people who are going to model certain behaviors and who are going to you know, demonstrate the second one about the importance of bridge building and civility and so forth. The, the, the catch is when you run out of religious, for the first one, where do you go with that? One lay president that I, I was talking to, he said, he's at another Franciscan school, and as long as there are religious sisters on that campus, they're helping him to inform the mission because they're the sisters and they went through a novitiate and they know about it. His fear is that when there are no sisters on the campus, then what's that going to be like? Because it's just, in his mind, it won't quite be the same. So, so where do you go with that? And I think that's where the dilemma is. You know, you've got a mission officer, a campus minister, somebody who's got to transmit that because really that's, that's, that's I think, at the core of what's setting the institution apart. It feels like you have to have some kind of proactive structures to Culturate faculty, faculty of goodwill, mm -hmm. is what that means. Mm -hmm. like, you know, you can't no longer be carried just by the presence of religious and volume or whatever. You know? Although in practice, I've, uh, at least uh, at my university, it's been much more difficult in practice than in theory. Because yeah. in many ways, you know, the to said the brother, you know, brothers of the Villasalian brothers are diminishing. Yeah. Uh, and there's been a lot of effort to um, to, to train some of the, the the faculty and lay people. But you know, the, the the lay people the, the lay faculty just don't have the the years of experience yeah. uh, with the with the charism and the tradition that the brothers had. And also the second part of the first question, I f find particularly interesting because I've been through a couple of hiring uh, cycles for hiring faculty and. Uh, and, and the mantra is diversity, which means right. uh, you, you, you're going to look for anyone but a Catholic <laughs> to fill a spot. Um, you know, or, or at least that's not, it's, if, you, if you bring that up as a factor, that is, uh, that is well, discouraged. Um, so it's, there, there are real powerful cultural forces acting against us uh, in, in many ways. Uh, is, is there a culture, I mean, when I was at Nova years ago, I felt mm -hmm. that was the case, so it's changed, but 
at LaSalle, I mean, that great, that great Christian Brothers charism of education. Uh -huh, yeah. Is that still a lot? I mean, you, you, should, you, you speak as if that's not still alive. Well, I mean, it's still, it's, 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 it's. I mean, across, I mean, beyond. Uh, well, of course, there's, there's the emphasis on, there's the emphasis on educating the poor and marginalized first right. generation students, which, of course, I fully support, but it's been secularized. Um, okay. It's now becoming, uh, and so there's not really, um, uh, there's not, and, and, and of Those course. diversity driven social well, justice. Yeah, driven. yeah, social, okay. social justice, diversity. These are, the, these are the, the mantras, I would say, the idols of the age. Um, and, uh, and, and also, too, I, I, you know, as, a full, as chair of the philosophy department, while well, I do appreciate that the, the mission has to inform everything, I think there is a real place for formal philosophical, theological instruction. I mean, there, you, you, you can't, you know, it's, it's, uh, you, you, you cannot know what, the, what, the, what kind of education you're getting without it being made explicit, at least in some way. Mm -hmm. There has to be some sort of philosophical, theological. For the students, yeah. yeah. But of course, now many of the faculty don't have that formation at all yeah, either. Right. And, so. and, and, and there is this uh, great quote from Lincoln that uh, uh, the philosophy of today's classroom is the politics of tomorrow. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. That is, uh, what sort of philosophical reflection is going on uh, in the classrooms? Or what sort of mindset mm -hmm. is um, prevailing yeah. in today's classroom is going to be uh, uh, really serious implications uh, <laughs> and the, uh, when that generation takes over yeah, the yeah. Uh, leading positions in, in society. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to the point that a couple of you made, I mean, uh, that a number of camp uh, universities now in the US, Catholic universities, there are uh, institutes forming. We, have, we just launched a uh, Center for Catholic Studies uh, it has a, you know, a handful of goals. Probably the most important goal are uh, to have a, a group of faculty who invite other faculty who are interested, to yeah. your point, Jeremy, in, in joining a workshop, a reading group over, a, mm -hmm. you know, over a semester, over a year. And we're just long, we've just begun that about a year and a half ago. But that's that's you know that's a response and the, uh, to the formation issue, even among. Uh, and maybe sometimes, especially among the Catholics or, or, or religious people who you mm -hmm. hire, they may be as they may be, uh, you know, being a, what I would call a cradle Catholic. Most of the cradle Catholics I know are not could could not yeah. impart uh, in a welcoming way uh, uh, Catholic intellectual tradition. They've never heard of Catholic social teaching, which is an important doctrine that we all talk about among ourselves, but. Um, but almost no Catholics who go to church on Sunday would have ever heard that term. You know, it's amazing, but I, I, I didn't think that, that it would remind you, but it, it's really like inbreeding that curtails fertility, meaning it's, if you, if you, if education is too similar, yeah. and the idea of like, uh, of wanted to say that uh, you have a clear education message, uh, you actually do, you do incest. You know, all the teachers and all these are more like the same color, and this is, this really curtails fertility. Uh, yeah, that's why maybe, the, that's why uh, you have diminishing number of people. Uh, the solution of, of bringing, making more varied is not only because it's necessary because you don't have your own teachers. Yeah. Maybe this is something that should be done, and with modern technology you can do it in the <coughs> and in writing, in, in correspondence, in, in, uh, in Zoom, in many ways, in the virtual classrooms, and to have workshops that, like we had, you could be exposed, you could be exposed to students. And then you have some, something that offers much more to a student that is, the students are not expected to come out more or less the same. It's not attractive nowadays. Nowadays, a person wants to be his own person to do something special, something meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, so what it is, it can select from a variety. Once you have a variety of influences, you can model yourself in, in, uh, 
in a unique way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to move on to the next story. Yeah. yeah. Don't the Jesuits do a false right? Yeah. Don't the Jesuits do a Yeah, they do. Don't they have a, a formation of a lay that is. Well, we, talked about, we, we talked about the way in which I, at least in the brief time I've been at Georgetown, do find there to be however much. At, at least a, a palpable, maybe not a dominant, but a palpable culture that engages, you know, you know we're talking to John, we joke about Georgetown, Jesuit but not Catholic, uh, but engages Ignatian traditions. Um, you know, I think our president and others take seriously a norm of pure personalis, education of the whole person. Students buy into that. It's not just a joke or a flag that Right. That, um, that, that we hang to bring in people to market ourselves. Um, educating the whole person. Uh, um, uh, uh, campus ministry, but also faculty members really care about teaching. There are the varieties of ways in which, again, perhaps a secularized version of the examine mm -hmm. is part of the culture of a number of our students, where yeah. they reflect yeah. upon the meaning of their lives and what is consoling, what is not. Now these might be just little things, but for me, even in contrast in some respects to where I was, these matters, these issues, these, these tendencies in, in, in the Ignatian tradition of higher education, I mean all those original guys had masters from the University of Paris, that seemed to give me as an educator in Catholic higher education more of a leg up in thinking as a Roman Catholic that way. In contrast to a, a great university, you know, your son went there, yeah. where I didn't have the same hook into Catholic higher education uh, among the Augustinians of Villanova. So in my experience, that in my experience, it has been a good thing in my department. Even though, you know, I mean, I think we should do better on the Catholic side. I think it. I think students. I think faculty buy into. To, 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 to educating the whole person and considering some of these Ignatian traditions. I, I, that's my experience. Well, we still have a ton of Jesuits around. Not so many of us. But you probably have one of the largest kind of more Jesuits, Jesuits, Jesuits yeah. in the world. Mm -hmm. And there is that kind of coherent thing, right. the Ignatian thing. You know, how widely diffused in the faculty it is is an open question to me, but it's certainly mm -hmm. widely diffused, I think, in the undergraduate programming. I agree. Uh, yeah, I agree. So, but. You know, in a way, that's just deferring. I mean, you know, that'll be the case as long as we have a gazillion Jesuits around. Probably, it won't be the case when we don't. Uh, so, I think. I mean, I actually think this is kind of a church-wide problem in a way. I mean, we have a set of structures for forming people that are more or less were set up by the Council of Trent, and we're not in the Council of Trent kind of world. And the bishops, I mean, not just the, I'm not throwing stones at the bishops, I think everybody's got this, but we more or less have been limping along like the situation since the 1960s has been some kind of irregular emergency situation and the day is gonna come back where we're gonna have a gazillion SM brothers again and everything else. But that's not, this is the new normal. We gotta figure out how to do it with the vocations that we have, mm -hmm. which mostly are lay vocations right now. So. Anyway, yeah. John, how do you how do you hire for mission? I mean, do you do something different? Than I think we do it different from any place. Uh, Thank God. I, uh, <laughs> uh, I I've now hired the provost and deans of all the twelve schools, and that's the key, right? There. All of them provost and dean. know mm -hmm. that. Uh, I want it, uh, every position that we're hiring for to uh, advertise that we're looking for Catholics, not people who are baptized, but people who love the church. And when people, uh, part of the application process is a statement about what you might contribute to the mission of the university, and part of the interview process is about that. Uh, when people, get, so it, it produces somewhere between 65 and 90% serious Catholics, the rest are Orthodox Jews, Evangelical Protestants, Mormons, uh, uh, people who are mm -hmm. serious about their faith. Uh, for the first five years they're on campus, we run uh, every month a, 
kind of enculturation thing about what it means to be teaching at a Catholic university and what your role might be. Part of the application for part of the tenure process is what have you contributed to the. So we don't hire a whole lot of um, um, religious, I mean, ordained religious, religious and vows, but um, we're really serious about it. I, I would say um, this is in a way a foil to that. I mean, I'm in the theology department, so my experience was atypical in terms of the hiring process, but the uh, <coughs> incoming faculty initiation process or incoming faculty orientation process at Boston College, in my experience of it, now I'm on camera, so, but I'm going to say this anyway. It, it largely was oriented around neutralizing the for for the incoming faculty. Now we're a research university and so forth. People were coming there probably mostly not Catholic and fearful about what it might mean to be at a Catholic university. So most of the orientation was explaining to them mm. this is a Jesuit and Catholic place, but it's okay. That's not really going to affect what you do. <laughs> and I was, you know, I just I didn't fit, I wasn't real happy about that. I thought that somewhere in there there's a happy medium, which sounds a little bit more like what you're trying, I mean, even if you're, but anyway, I don't know exactly what I want to say about that. That's on the debit side of the ledger. We're not going to send this to your president, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but he might be scouting around. <laughs> the Rob Schottheim. Well, anyway, I mean, I, I think there's a, there is a problem there. There, there isn't a careful enculturation. Yeah. in my experience, um, of, of that side of the thing, anyway. And you think it's possible nowadays? Let's say you try to start something, process like this. You think it will have buyers, people, you have customers? Well, you have to start with hiring, probably. Mm -hmm. But there are people with goodwill. I think you could, you could say to them, look, um, that, you know, this is how we understand ourselves. I mean, at some point, the, the, you have to stop and say, well, what is it the church's interest in sponsoring a, uh, an institution of higher learning and have a discussion about what that means? And if you're going to mm -hmm. invite other people to collaborate, I think that's, that, could, that could be all to the good, but I think you want to involve them in that conversation. I mean, if I came to your place, I would want to be to learn you know, what you understand yourselves to be doing, having a Jewish university and so forth. And I think we should extend that invitation and expectations. Sure, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think- But the, once we do that- you know, He points out the thing that there's been a lot of inconsistent hiring, so there's a lot of water under the bridge yeah. at a place like Boston College. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's hard to- It's hard, it's hard to, to change. It's hard to reverse decades of- Yeah, you know, it's of, a delicate operation. And, uh, the Jesuits could well, lose the university if they pushed it too hard. I think you could have a faculty revolt. Yeah, uh, but the, there have been successful- uh, Yeah. Some colleges have successfully and Lady's very skillful, I think, actually. He's trying, I think he sees that there's a problem. Our president sees that there are these issues, and I think he's, but he realizes it's delicate, and he can't just do a frontal assault on the thing, so mm -hmm. it's a long term. Yeah. Anyway. All right, I'm going to move on in the interest of getting to bed early tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the second story. Nope. Oh. Yeah, that's the first one. If you press it too many times, it's going to just jump to the end again. Is that what's going to happen? <laughs> there we go. All right. I mentioned our Catholic Intellectual Tradition series, and this year our uh, series really was following the, uh, you know, primarily focused on the uh, clergy abuse uh, issues that are global, but including in the United States. Uh, but we also wanted uh, to move beyond the crisis and think about other issues. Uh, one of the, uh, I mean, I, I, I quote here Father Ted Hesburgh, uh, longtime president of Notre Dame, to really underscore that I think most of us uh, per perceive that our role is to extend beyond uh, the fences or the walls of our campus, and I think that's when I when I look at your image here, it's mm -hmm. it's to not to 
reform or construct a better university, but to reform or construct a better world. And so that, um, that's the point of the second story. And uh, our, really one of our, we have three, we're having three speakers this year, uh, Peter Steinfels, who I think most of the uh, folk, uh, uh, folks from the United States know as one of the leading commentators on the Catholic Church, a late commentator on the Catholic Church in the United States, a longtime uh, religion columnist for the New York Times, author in about, I think about 15, 16 years ago of a book on um, the Catholic Church in crisis called The People Adrift. So he was a, uh, he was a keynote speaker for what became a symposium and, and, in, and he was part of the symposium too. And the second panel was really moving beyond just the, it, the, just the current, if we can ever move beyond the current uh, uh, crisis that is plaguing the, the U.S. Catholic Church and beyond to think about how to, other issues, other challenges, other opportunities for the church in the United States. And, and in the course of the conversation, as I said, Stan, Steinfeld said our, had lectured actually the night before. He was mostly quiet. Um, we had a couple of uh, theology professors, one of whom was uh, from our own faculty. We had uh, uh, Father Jim Heft, who was uh, uh, former provost at uh, Dayton mm -hmm. University and now oversees a, an, a, the Institute for Advanced uh, Study for uh, Catholic Studies. And that was the panel and Peter Steinfels. And at one point, the moderator said to, P said to Peter, Peter, you've been kind of quiet. And he said, well, I have one question to pose to the theologians here. And he really looked at my colleague. Um, as you think about your career, uh, how, do you, how do you think about becoming, uh, or are you planning to become a public scholar? And I think by that, he meant uh, scholarship that will, would address uh, the world outside the academic world, outside the academy. And uh, our, our, my colleague is a wonderful uh, professor, uh, really a very fine teacher and a developing scholar. And she's untenured. Uh, I think that's part of, part of the answer when she looked at him and very honestly said, that terrifies me to think about uh, becoming a public scholar to be to engage the public square, whatever the the broader community, and he, you know, he said, "Well, tell me more." And she said, "I, it's outside my comfort zone. I, you know, I was educated to, you know, to, to be a specialist, and you're asking me, early in my career, but at any stage of my career, to go be outside my comfort zone. So I'm going to be uh, easy on the gas here." And so I, you know, I pose to the group, uh, I think that's, uh, I was reading Jeremy Wilkins paper that you submitted, uh, uh, you know, value specialization, I think you used the word, being provocative, saying something new and original, but, cert but specialization, how do, in a, in a world in which the academy has valued specialization, how do we encourage faculty to go outside their comfort zones and communicate with the world. Uh, I, when, when we first started chatting, you said, I want you to think about how do we connect the scholars, the philosophers, the ethicists to, to the practical world. And there, you know, I'm Jim and I and John, we're sort of straddling the, the two worlds. So I, I thought I would ask the question. And then the second question is, and how can universities build bridges and promote, and this is really related to the earlier question, promote respectful discourse outside the academy mm -hmm. in the public square, if possible. Yeah. Well, I, I think to the first uh, one, it may be not, you know, this may not be specific examples or practical, but I think stressing to people within the academy that if we don't communicate, somebody else will, you know? And so I think there, there's an imperative, really, you know, to be a voice in the public square, because if we don't communicate our message, either someone communicates it for us or it's a completely different message. So in terms of how you get to that specifically, I think there's you know, yeah. different ways you could encourage it. But to me, that's the overarching important piece right. in all this. Noah, you have it. Uh, so just sort of as a representative of the young scholars crowd, um, since I'm a <laughs> still a doctoral candidate, I have a lot of friends who are recent PhDs. Uh, 
I really do think that the tenure issue, particularly with respect to what you were talking about with your first story, about yeah. how polarized everything is, and this new you know, mm. sort of call out and cancel culture, yeah. um, I know for a fact that even in response to things that are directly endangering them, like anti Semitism on campus, um, so many young scholars are afraid to say anything because they're worried about essentially just damaging their career irreparably. So I think, A, um, it's very important for senior scholars who have that protection of tenure <coughs> to be the vanguard and set an example, um, both in terms of talking and in terms of um, trying to, to protect against a, a backlash of call-out culture with other scholars who may, they may disagree with on content. Right, so not just not just the vanguard about talking, but the vanguard about trying to return kind of a civility of discourse, um, but also possibly even thinking about structural ways to protect non-tenured faculty who might get attacked, and, and somehow insulating them from from some of the backlash. Yeah, that's once you have. Uh, tenure, there's questions of promotion. Mm. And there's all kinds of sanctions mm. one suffers if one speaks and against And once you don't it, worry, you're too old of them. If one speaks <laughs> against the majority, I would say. You know, the majority opinion. Within the university, especially. In talking among your colleagues, so is that with this, within the department, within the school? Yeah, uh, within the university especially. Yeah. So, you know, within one's own department, within one's own college, all kinds of sanctions. Is there a sanction again? I think, you know, Steinfels was a columnist and he's a you know, popular author. That, well, there, there's not a polit, there's not a, I mean, that's a, that's a related but different issue, right? Uh, writing the op-ed piece. Uh, well, it would depend a lot on what you were addressing it. Yeah. Whether it would be safe to say. <laughs> mm. Right. <laughs> well, we used, to, we used to have a communications director who, would, who had really good contacts with the local <laughs> press. And he would get us interviews, uh, op-ed pieces in the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, various interviews on local television and things like that. But then uh, our new president came in and uh, he was one of the first jobs to go. Wow. And so <laughs> since then we've had nothing uh, in, in the local media. Um, uh, we, of course, we yeah. agree that it was a very short-sighted, uh, it was a very, very short-sighted firing, but, you know. Do you have any thoughts about yes, this question? Yes, after listening, no. In fact, if you are all very tired, so people really speak about the truth. Yeah. And, uh, and I, hear, I hear things, tremendous, you know, candor. I think what you are calling for is not, uh, not considering the, your mob background, but you are calling for a revolution. <laughs> it's uh, some, something very fundamental has to change. It's not it's not a change, it's not a cosmetic change. Something very fundamental of identity has to change. Thing has to be defined. Otherwise, it, it, it really looks like, like times of revolution in history that old regimes try to hold with their teeth the existing uh, system hmm. and they will persecute people that will try to revolt. And especially universities that depend on budget and things on their own. Organized the church of orders, but what you actually what you're calling you're showing there is no no way that uh, you make evolution evolution in concepts and and <laughs> I, I really wonder I really wonder how come the church whatever organized church or orders don't see the problem and don't say we have to initiate the change instead of keeping the status quo and, and letting you 
having the problem of diminishing number of students at the front, you'll see. We will take this, but if they don't, then it has to come from the university. Yeah, well, that's a related, I mean, that's a very related question. I, and again, I think Jeremy addressed that in the, the, the chapter that you sent us. The, the relation, the, the, the dysfunctional relationship in many dioceses between the bishop and and the Catholic College or the because Catholic University. Such, such a population being calls for some kind of more radical change yeah. Yeah. that would have happened if it was promoted by the bishops. In fairness, I mean, I mean, in fairness, I mean, here we are all struggling trying to figure out what should we do about these things, and the bishops don't know what to do either. It's everybody's struggling. I think it's just they don't know that you're struggling. No, they, they know that we're struggling. They themselves are struggling. They don't know what the answers they, are. They don't They've have control over all kinds of problems. problems. I mean, the, the, the frayed relationship between the bishops and the Catholic universities is just one thing. Those guys have a lot of that's all things. That's the Catholic universities, by the way. What do you um, mean? There was this uh, big conflict between the Bishop of Paris and the University of Paris. In the, in 12, um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, an old story. <laughs> uh, it's a very old story. <laughs> so, so it's, a, it's not a new phenomenon. <laughs> but the point, is, the, point is, the point is that I kind of want to make, I think, is yeah. just that the, 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 the whole, in, the institutions are, it feels like they're in crisis all across the board. So it's not just like, um, I mean, there's just so many things happening at once, and so much imagining of new possibilities that probably needs to be happening. And no, nobody just really seems to have the capability to just do all the thinking. And you know, I don't blame the bishops any more than I. I mean, I just think it's it's just a hard situation, and I don't know what to do. So I don't blame anybody. It's not a matter of blame. Yeah, it's a matter of. Make a change, even though you don't yeah. have a solution. You don't know yes. how it will work. Like Abraham, but you know it's, to the it's impossible. Now, it now we are impossible. Yeah. And much of what you said is relevant to, to Jewish education, mm. and uh, uh, I think it's a universal problem of religion. There's a signal there. Uh, polarization, as you know, is. is of when Israel will in America, it's, it's, we have the same, more or less the same problem. And uh, I, I, this, uh, there is no other way but to try, try to break the existing mm. borders and frameworks of trying to think of something new. It, it seems to me also that there is a, a, a lack of courage in the leadership in the orders, in the bishops, even in the presidents. People don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers. They don't want to draw any extra attention. And they don't want to say what is true. They don't want to speak the truth. I will tell uh, tell more of the story. We, uh, we uh, the Texas bishops all uh, agreed to release names on January 31st of this year. And, and I, I have a very strong relationship with our archbishop. And I approached him and I said, I think, you know, you people aren't going to trust you if, if there's not a check. And so I propose, and this was after the Pennsylvania grand jury and, you know, the attorney generals and district attorneys across the nation were starting to get interested in getting the records themselves and doing whatever they're going to do with them. So I proposed that, that he form an independent lay commission, and he did. And uh, that was to his great credit. And so, I, uh, part Is it Gomez? No, it was Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sierra. He appointed. Um, there were seven of us, and we, you know, read 150 files, and and um, we audited what the names that they were releasing, and we and we uh, and we issued our own report. And it was uh, with but a few quibbles, a very positive report. They're uh, they've really done, you know, pretty good things over the last decade to 15 years. Uh, and then this conference, uh, we we uh, we. We were going to do, and of course, I was very careful, and I went and approached the uh, the priest who had been overseeing the their, the archdiocesan <laughs> side of it. And I said, "We'd like you to be involved." He said, "He got very angry. No, 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 we don't want to talk about it at all." And, and we uh, approached the bishop, archbishop, and the auxiliary bishop, and we had this symposium in which the archdiocese did not show up. Uh, 
uh, someone from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops did, but not mm -hmm. the Archdiocese. And to, to that, you know, it's just it's it's a it's a challenging relationship. Uh, I'm not talking about my relation, but I think it's a challenging relationship to to your question to sit down and figure out how we can work together. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think you you put your finger on it. They've, it's got to be a collective effort to try to work through the issues that are common to us that the bishops don't know how to address and we don't know how to address or we're not coming together to address them right. jointly. Right. Maybe you should call for a new church council. I'll get right to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any, uh, any last remarks? If not, it's in your hands. Thank you. Thank you all. It was anyway. Thank you. Just a few brief remarks. We had a long day. It started with a Bible reading, which was, which was most enjoyable. It was an excellent presentation of uh, Reverend Matasse. It was really very interesting. And it went on to where. Uh, uh, what we have done is, yeah, I forgot already. <laughs> oh, yes, I forget. It was very good. We had lunch. And then we had, <laughs> we had our version of Dan Brown, and then Professor Primeir that gave us the strategy what will a perfect world be like when everything, everyone will. We realize that everyone is part of a necessary puzzle, of God's puzzle, and no extra idea, or no, not, nothing. So you cannot give up any idea or any concept. Professor Jacobson that showed us what will happen in the next 10 years in science and technology, emulating human brain. And uh, now this uh, candid and excellent we, we didn't speak about ideas, we spoke about reality. <laughs> it is much tougher to handle. Is, yeah. Ideas are much more flexible. <laughs> <laughs> ideas are like quicksand. You can, but building, you build on that. It, it, it is, here we had a taste of reality, flavor of reality, which is very, very important. Now you all know what the Tikkun Olam needs, or the idea is, is to we really have to change the way people identify themselves. What's important, not important. The, when you say that you need a good discussion, the ability to discuss openly and with, uh, and with uh, res respectfully and to exchange ideas, it will only come not because it's a proper way to do or, or because it's not nice to do it otherwise. It's only when people will realize what's important what's really important, how they become better human beings, how, how, and, and how they have more impact on the world. You don't have more impact by being rude or being uh, aggressive. If people realize that they have more impact if they are good people. Because people want to have impact. Like you said, like your children want to do something that matters, something that is important. And I think that educators should pull all the resources to empower the students to, and show them how they can have impact on the future of the world, how can the, the world can be a better place. So of course, I don't know how many people think that we are reaching a dead end, in the, that the situation is becoming bad, but you know that famous saying of Lenin that the worse it will become, the worse the situation will become, then the better it's, it's all for the better because it will call for revolution. But we should do it before that. <laughs> uh, so, some deep change is needed before uh, everything, all, all, the, all the things will break. With it. And I was really impressed with the people that we, that we have here with, with the idea and the courage to, to think aloud and, and to maybe show a direction. We have a few more days of discussion and I hope that something will come out of this, not only airing our problems but 
they will decide on doing something, of having workshops in our places with all of us, or with few of us, having, having joint uh, discussions, including the students, across religions, across disciplines, invite more people. Uh, okay, this is just about the concept. Rory told me that I should explain what Tikkun Olam is. Uh, and I'll tell you, I have an old Hasidic saying that says, I don't know what the truth is, but I know what falsehood is. Mm. And not falsehood must be true. So, you know, what, how do you repair the world? We don't know. You know how you corrupt the world. So the more you can navigate yourself from, away from corrupting the world, then probably it's towards repairing the world. <laughs> this, is the, this is the thing. Now, I want to extend an invitation to you. Uh, Alexander here was kind enough to, to agree that we have an ongoing project of our Bible reading. And this takes place a whole week in the Galilee, in Nesamim. Now, we chose a venue, Nesamim, in the Galilee. Very, very nice place, very quiet, very remote for any, from any, uh, from a city, from... There is a small shopping center next, by the, by the, by the next door, but that's it. And we, we do the Bible in more than an hour and a half. It's really very interesting experience. And when we finish the thing, no one in the group thinks that we did too much. They all said, no one is satisfied. No one said, ah, wonderfully it ended this. Really, in the middle of something, they want, want to move away. We had aspects of music written on, on pieces of, uh, of, of passages in the Bible. And many, many discussions of, of uh, various texts and attitudes to the text and art. Alexander showed us the, the, uh, the text that we learned in Christian art. It's fascinating and it brings people together in a way that you cannot imagine. There is some secret. <laughs> I was asked to write about it. I tried to break the secret. How come the text can bring people together so so within such so much trust and understanding, and people come again and again and again from all over the world to, to come. So it is July what? 13 to 19. 13 to 19 July in Esamim in Israel. So if you could mm-hmm. write in your calendar, we invite you all. You'll get more formal invitation. And, uh, you know, mark it in the calendar and keep your minds open. It's summer in Israel. It's <laughs> definitely not cold. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not cold. It can be called inside. Inside. <laughs> inside. <laughs> and of, of what month? July. July. And the food is unbelievable. Mm. You have, you have so, three square. As good as the food here? Better. So <laughs> no, the food is really unbelievable. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so and the experience is wonderful, and we are invited. This, maybe this is something real that we can do in order to make a change, something like this, because it's an amazing tool, and it should we can then carry it to our various places, some kind of ecumenic mm-hmm. uh, experience. Okay. Uh, yes. okay, thank you so much. One minute. One minute. Mama, 